The original Suicide Squad movie was a disappointment wrapped in a letdown, encompassed by mediocrity, and while it certainly had a couple of moments that didn't suck harder than an industrial vacuum that has been taking pointers from the Kardashians, it did suck harder than pretty much any superhero movie up until the release of Black Widow. Whoa, let me rephrase that. I wish I could forget about Captain Marvel, a movie so bad it took me three attempts to get through it because I kept falling asleep through utter boredom and obviously Black Panther, the only superhero movie that I couldn't even finish due to the utter tripe that was the storyline. This movie is nothing like that forgettable mess. This movie is a whole new mess that is absolutely unforgettable. Whether you love it or hate it, you are not going to forget about it in a hurry. Before I get started though, please consider subscribing as that would really help me out, and if you like this content, give it a like. Okay, on with the review. The movie opens with the Suicide Squad, or a Suicide Squad, made up of low-tier characters you have never heard of, including a, uh, well, this thing, and a few survivors of the last movie, namely Harley Quinn, Captain Boomerang, and Rick Flagg. James Gunn was clearly unhappy that in the original movie, not enough of the cast was killed horribly because he really goes all out in the first 20 minutes to remind everyone that these people are supposed to be expendable, and boy are they. James Gunn shows no remorse in killing them in the most gruesome, over-the-top ways he could think of. Even Captain Boomerang gets splatted, which was a bit sad after he made it through the last movie. Harley Quinn gets captured and Rick Flagg escapes the carnage, and instead gets captured by a counter-revolutionary group that is working against the um, main revolutionary group. Once James Gunn gets over his initial bout of bloodlust, we find that this Suicide Squad was in fact just a decoy, so that another Suicide Squad could have an easy time getting to the island. Cue a flashback in which we find that the island of, uh, well, whatever, has had a regime change and is now in the hands of a bunch of people who don't like America and are threatening to release a monster that they have hidden in a special research facility. The story of this movie is about as simple as it gets, and there is no point in trying to make it sound more impressive than A goes to B and does C. I don't think the story was important to James Gunn, he was only interested in the situation and who could be made to spread their entrails across the screen. Amanda Waller is back to set our new Suicide Squad onto the case, and this time round she means business, which basically means she is the same horrible bitch she always was. The Suicide Squad is made up of Idris Elba as a character I have never heard of called Bloodsport, replacing Will Smith's dead shot from the first movie, and yes, they couldn't decide if this should have been a sequel or a remake, so they went with a kind of hybrid. Idris Elba is solid as a rock, which is what we have come to expect from him. He jumped straight into Will Smith's shoes as though Smith had never even worn them. Next, we have Peacemaker, played by China's favourite little cuck, John Cena, Sorry, second favourite, I forgot about the big guy. John Cena does what he does, and in this case, is actually quite engaging, which surprised me, as he was extremely generic in F9. The rock this guy ain't, but what he is, is, uh, a uh, muscly. And, well, anyway. Up next, we have Polka Dot Man. We're all gonna die. I hope so. Oh, for fuck's sake. A character I'd never heard of, and one that was a refreshing change of pace for a superhero movie, as he fits no known mould, and his power is... well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's polka dots? Then we have what I consider to be the heart of this movie, a character that contains all the emotion and vulnerability this movie has to offer, and a character that, at first, seems as though she is going to be dull and uninteresting, and about as worthy of being in this movie as a bloke with detachable arms. And that is Ratcatcher 2, played by Daniela Mechior. Mechior? Mechior. Mechior. Who does an excellent job of making this character someone that is relatable and interesting. Last but not least is King Shark, voiced by Sylvester Stallone. And I have to say, he was by far my favourite character and the one that got the most laughs and the biggest reaction from the people I saw it with. From nearly eating Ratcatcher 2 to his extraordinary observation skills. Any questions? Sure. Hand. Yes, that is your hand in our way. Very good. He was just a lot of fun to watch, and one of the few characters I actually began to care about, which in a film where just about anybody may die at any moment is a risky proposition. 
I mean, if giant CGI creatures can now outact humans, then how long is it until all movies are just realistic looking cartoons and voice actors take over from physical actors? Oh, and um, Rick Flagg was in the movie again, but he was about as interesting as a soggy wet lettuce leaf, and salad isn't really my thing, so let's leave it there. The Suicide Squad land on a beach not too far from the other Suicide Squad and cue some really dumb jokes followed by a murderously unnecessary rescue of Rick Flagg, which is our first chance to see this new Suicide Squad in action, and they are pretty impressive, if a little brutal. The Suicide Squad then captures the Thinker, played by Peter Capaldi, who is on top form in this movie, as the not particularly mad scientist though anyone who has electrodes sticking out of their head can't be the full ticket. He has been carrying out the research at the facility and they need him to get them inside. After a bit of a kerfuffle, they find that Harley Quinn has been captured and so decide to break her free. Cue an overpowered Harley Quinn scene that I've just found somewhat annoying since she has less skills than the guys that got slaughtered on the beach earlier. Oh, and there is a stupid story involving a javelin that I can't be bothered to elaborate on because it isn't worth the time. Harley then joins the rest of the crew and they head off to the facility to destroy the dangerous thing that they have been hiding, which turns out to be, and I was both surprised, shocked, and somewhat in awe of James Gunn's temerity in including what could be thought of as a really stupid enemy, but which was in fact a kind of stroke of genius because it was so unlikely and almost completely unheard of outside of comic book circles. I mean, you have to be a huge fan to have heard of Starro the Conqueror. And yes, he is a giant space starfish. It is utterly bonkers, and while some will scoff, I thought it was just amazing. I can almost imagine the meeting in which they decided that a giant starfish would be the main bad guy. They must have actually had someone there that had read the comics, because your average suit would have just immediately called for something much, much more generic. In the build-up to the release of Starro, Rick Flagg finds out that the US government is responsible for horrible experiments that have been done on people with Starro, and he decides that he wants to release the data to the public. Peacemaker, who has been working in secret for Waller to stop any information from getting out, kills Flag and is about to kill Ratcatcher too when Bloodsport suddenly appears and shoots him with a um, a small bullet. Ow. Smaller bullets. Now they have the simple job of defeating the giant starfish, which it turns out is actually more difficult than you would have thought, but Waller must have known what she was doing because they have just about the only team that would have done the job. Sadly, Polka Dot Man, who turns out to have an utterly devastating weapon, is killed just as he achieves his dream. I'm a superhero! And King Shark finally bites off more than he can chew. But luckily, Ratcatcher 2's ability to control rats saves the day and we are treated to a rat version of World War Z's zombies. With the final coup de grace being delivered with the help of Harley Quinn with the stupid javelin. Then Bloodsport uses the Star of Facility data to bribe Waller into freeing the squad survivors and they all go off into the sunset to probably murder people and generally make the world a worse place. So, first things first, was this movie a woke trash fest like just about every other superhero movie in Wokeywood, I mean Hollywood? And the answer is no. Surprisingly, there is nothing to report on this front. The movie was simply a movie and nothing more, which for this day and age is something of a minor miracle. Secondly, why the hell was Harley Quinn even in this movie? You can cut her part out and it would have made no discernible difference. In fact, it would have shortened it by 15 minutes and made the middle section less of a snooze fest and given the movie much better pacing, which it definitely needed. James Gunn made a halfway decent movie here. It wasn't great, it wasn't bad, it wasn't meh. It was good enough that if it came on TV, you would probably sit and watch it. As superhero movies go, it wouldn't make my top 5, but it would probably be somewhere in the top 10, lurking about waiting to bludgeon any passers-by. I wanted to enjoy it more than I did, but the story was by the books and I'm not a big fan of ultra-violent movies. I would rather have a clever, engaging plot than arms and legs and entrails all over the place. But that's just me. Preferences differ. In any case, if you do decide to catch this movie, and you're a tad squeamish, then be sure to bring a bath bag because you're gonna need it. This has been Movie Sucks and Shark Lives Matter!
signing out. Leave a like, share, subscribe, and I will catch you guys on the flip side. The Birds of Prey. The other super shit superhero movie that was out recently. How did I forget about that? Bloody hell.